So, hi, uh, my name is Jessica Eisen. I'm the representative for ICAS in Oceania uh, and one of the conference organisers. I want to start the night by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, <coughs> the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and to pay right respect to elders past and present. So I'm just going to start off with some boring housekeeping and then uh, I'll go into discussing uh, ICAS and then I will introduce our speaker Dinesh. So, a uh, few things. The uh, toilets are just down this way. Uh, there's some up the stairs and some around the corner, uh, if anyone needs those. Uh, we have some t-shirts for, sa for sale and stickers. This is the shirt. $25. Please buy one. Uh, if you're tweeting tonight or over the conference, the hashtag is ICAS Oceania 2015. Uh, so please use that one. So, for the conference, if you're coming along, um, we've still got plenty of places left, so if you want to just pay uh, tomorrow when you come or if you just come on Saturday, uh, please do. Uh, lunch, we still have a couple of lunches left for tomorrow, but none left for Saturday, um, and that's from the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre. So if you are coming tomorrow and you want to get lunch, please do and support them. Uh, and we still have some places left for dinner tomorrow night, uh, which will be in, um, at Edinburgh Gardens, uh, with being catered by Los Vegan. Uh, we also have some donation uh, uh, containers out the front that are looking very bare. We run completely on a volunteer, organ it's a volunteer organisation, we're a collective, um, and we do all this via email, which is great fun. Uh, so please support us, especially if you're not coming to the conference and you're only here tonight, um, just to, if you, even if you can put a little bit of money in. We also have the Big Sky Sanctuary donation bucket there too, uh, which we're going to be going to on Sunday. If you put yourself down to be um, on the waiting list, come and see me at some point over the next day or two, um, so that we can talk about whether we can get you there. Also, you can join ICAS International, which is $40, uh, so come and see us about that as well, uh, which would be fantastic for you all to join up. So just briefly, um, ICAS is uh, grounded in animal liberation. It's a revolutionary scholarly research centre located in the community, organised by activists and community organisers, advancing critical animal studies influenced by a diversity of liberation movements. Uh, so if that doesn't um, excite you to join us, I don't know what will. <laughs> So um, for our opening night tonight, we really wanted to, um, this to be a book watch for Dinesh's book, um, but unfortunately we don't have any copies here for sale, but we do have, um, it's only just come out, this is hot off the press, the first one. Yes, I see you all looking. Um, so this is the only one so far, but there is, um, on, on the table at the front, you can buy, you can pick up the leaflets there for it um, and get yourself a copy. Uh, it's going to be, it's fantastic. I've read it. You know, I feel like the cool kid at the front of the line. Um, okay, so I'm just going to do. A, um, I'm just going to introduce Dinesh and then just do a really brief spiel about um, how his work um, is has affected my work, and then um, I'll bring him onto the stage. So um, Dinesh is the director of Masters of Human Rights at Sydney Uni. He completed a PhD at the University of Western Sydney in 2006, exploring theories of power and contemporary forms of state violence in the context of contemporary European political theory queer and feminist theory. <coughs> Dinesh has 15 years experience working in non-government organisations, working on disability rights and anti-poverty issues, including as Executive Officer of the National Ethics uh, Disability Alliance, <coughs> the national peak organisation representing people with disabilities from non-English speaking backgrounds in Australia. Oh sorry, National Ethnic Disability Alliance. Um, I always wish I thought that I got that around the wrong way. <laughs> Okay, so um, just briefly, I came across Dinesh's work um, first up on an article called Sex and the Lubricative Ethic, in which he, and I quote, challenges the idea that being penetrated has anything to do with passivity or the loss of power. Indeed, he questions whether relations of power that, that compose sexuality have any essential relationship to positions of mastery and subordination. Um, from there, I went and read his uh, The War Against Animals article, which is the precursor to the book that's uh, just come out, called The War Against Animals. Uh, in the book, Dinesh does, uh, through Foucault and Agamben, Dinesh shows us a new way of rethinking sovereignty. So uh, traditionally, we might think of sovereignty as, say, a king having power over people. Uh, but what Dinesh shows us is that actually sovereignty is about having the power to, uh, to let someone live, to let a community live. Uh, and, and that power is absolute when it comes to non-human animals. But also part of that power is having the ability to uh, bring lives almost to the point of death. But when we think about non-human animals, 
we actually start to realise um, when reading Dinesh's work that it's not just about having the power over life, but actually, in fact, having the power to bring to life uh, non-human animals. If we think about factory farming or uh, any other ways in which animals are exploited, it's always actually that they're brought to life for that purpose, and then that purpose of their life is to bring them to death. Uh, and so Dinesh makes, lets us hear, sh shows us that the sovereign power that humans have over animals is in fact what he calls a war against animals. But what's really great about his work is he shows in fact that at all times animals resist this. Uh, in one lecture he did he talks about the way, he talks about the ways in which fish resist uh, and specifically if we look at how a hook has been made uh, for fishing it always has the um, the backwards point on the, on the bar, right? Because we know inherently that they do not want to be caught, that they are subjects of a life. And the power of this is that we can start to see that animals are subjects of a life and that we know this inherently in the way that we exploit them is through their own resistance. So that's some of the really exciting work that comes from Dinesh. Um, and from that, the ways in which we can start to think about structural change, not just through veganism, but through uh, multiple other ways. So, that's just a brief overview of um, some of Dinesh's work and from the book. I really encourage you all, all to uh, have a read of it because I think it's really going to change critical animal studies and animal studies in general. So um, please join me in welcoming Dinesh to the stage. I feel a bit sad in that I saw that abstract that I sent. Oh, I sent that abstract late at night, and then the next day I immediately regretted it. It's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> so that people at the back, you're fine to go to sleep. It's okay. <laughs> um, but I'm going to. I thought, you know, what I'm going to do is try and. Uh, the thing that interests me is how do we appraise animals within capitalism, and can we advance a more sophisticated analysis than simply animals don't do well in the capitalism? I know that they don't, and we, I think everyone here can agree that animals don't do well under capitalism. But is there a way for us to theorise the role of animals under capitalism in different ways, and also with that, imagine both how we resist the forms of um, violence that animals are exposed to, but simultaneously how do we form different kinds of alliances? And so I'm going to try and talk a bit about some of that. But part of my interest today is to explore um, value and conflict over value. And I think, in some ways, conflicts over value are basically what all of us are familiar with when we think about animals. We, we, we value animals in a particular way, but we're confronted by society that values animals in a very different way. So I'm really interested in this, looking at this problem, but from a kind of master's lens. Um, I'm going to do my best to not be super theoretical and nerdy tonight. I'm going to try and uh, use Marx in a way that hopefully is approachable. I'm really happy for you to ask questions. So if you feel like there's just something that just doesn't make sense, please interrupt me. Um, and of course, happy to, in question time, try and get into some of the theory. I'm still learning some of this. In some ways, this is a follow-on to this book. So what I'm trying to do is I'm working on a book called, I think, Animals and Capital. And I'm interested in exploring some of these ideas and really pulling them apart. And today is a bit of an experiment too. So if you can bear with me, that you can come along with this journey. Animals and capitalism. Let's, let's leave aside use value, exchange value, and capitalist value, although they're going to come up today. To an extent, the welfareists were right. Animal welfareists have argued the best way to improve the treatment of animals is to increase their value. In this view, and against the animal rights position, the right to use animals is not questioned. On the contrary, it is assumed. The intrinsic value of animals does not outweigh their value to humans as use objects. In other words, the intrinsic value of animals, their moral worth, their rights, the value of their lives in themselves, has no bearing on their use value to humans, at least in the, the welfare discourse. The reason why I say that the welfareists were, at least to an extent, correct is that while perhaps most people here today might hold the view that animals have an intrinsic value, a value that is owed moral recognition, the real politics of our world is premised upon a violation at every moment of this intrinsic value through the application of a use value. 
We, only can, we can only value animals to the extent that they are useful to us, or so the welfareists tell us. And this proves to be incompatible with an animal rights point of view, saying that animals are worth something in themselves. To be charitable to the welfare perspective for the moment, there is a strong impulse here to reconcile two systems of value that at least on one on the face of it are impossible to reconcile. This reflects a realist rather than an idealist perspective on how we can improve the treatment of animals. Perhaps the most famous contemporary voice in animal welfare scholarship, John Webster, puts this issue quite plainly, and I'll quote a link from Webster. Webster says, and I quote, Truth may be eternal, but our perception of truth evolves. Two great pillars of truth, as we view it today, are in fact very new. The first is that Descartes was wrong. The animals we exploit for food are not mere machines, but sentient creatures with the capacity to recognise quality in life, both suffering and pleasure. It follows, therefore, that the greater our dominion over any animal, the greater our responsibility to provide it with a good life and a gentle death. Webster goes on. The second great but very new truth is that the needs of mankind are better served by the free market and by the command economy. The supermarket is more comfortable than the Kremlin. Those concerned with animal production have to reconcile the ideal and incompatible goals of good welfare and economic advantage." End quote. Webster's perspective continues to fascinate me, and not because I agree with it, I absolutely don't. Indeed, in a sense, Webster relies, oh sorry, the reason why Webster fascinates me is that he names the problems associated with value and contradiction that we have under capitalism and the reality that this poses for animals. One view, and this is the view that Webster puts forward, is that we cannot escape capitalism and we must accept and work with the values that capitalism presents us. Indeed, in a sense, Webster relies on a kind of ideological fatalism to arrive at his realist perspective. In this view, it is because capitalism is a reality we cannot imagine living without whether we like it or not, that we cannot possibly recognise the true value of animals, their, quote, absolute value. Instead, we must reconcile ourselves to the reality of good welfare being driven by the necessary tool of economic advantage. Another view, and this is a view that I would argue has been put forward by liberal approaches to animal rights, is that we must work harder to convince people of the contradictions in their value systems when it comes to animals what Gary Francione, Francione has somewhat unfortunately called our, quote, moral schizophrenia. In this view, convincing people of the intrinsic value of animals is key to shifting our investment in animal exploitation. And I'd say lots of animal rights discourse and action is about precisely doing this, convincing people that their value system is in contradiction. A different view, and the one that I want to explore today, is that we are confronted with problems of value both in how humans value animals and simultaneously how capitalism values animals, and that there is a political challenge before us in how we intervene in the production and politics of value. Unlike Webster, I don't believe we need to accept a fatalist view that the intrinsic value of animals must be set by human use values under capitalism, nor do I accept that capitalism is the best system for mediating conflicts in value. But unlike many liberal philosophers, I'm not convinced that simply demonstrating the intrinsic value of animals is enough. Unfortunately, we are confronted by a world where use values, both human and non-human, dominate all systems of value. I certainly don't have all the answers today. As I said, this is an experiment. But against these approaches, one thing I'm interested in is how we construct a politics that is interested in how we can intervene and shift systems of value. My focus today will be a philosopher who's not necessarily talked about much today, and certainly not talked and spoken about with any great frequency in animal studies. I refer, of course, to Karl Marx, who, as I shall discuss, is interesting not only because of the critique of capitalism he offers, but because of, his understa of the understanding he provides for thinking about value. While Marx's scholarship is limited in animal studies, there is a small, and I would suggest growing, field of interest happening internationally. Ted Benton, for example, in his book Natural Rights, Ecology, Rights and Social Justice, 
has levelled a critique at the classical Marxist conception of, conception of humanity's quote, species of being, arguing Marx was mistaken in suggesting that humans labour in a way that's distinctive and raises them above other species, other animal species. Barbara Nosky, in her Beyond Boundaries, puts forward a Marxist account of animal alienation in food production systems, drawing tools from Marx to suggest that animals face specific forms of alienation and exploitation under capitalism. Other scholars like Bob Torrance, Jason Kugel, and David Knight have all made contributions drawing extensively from Marx to understand oppression, resistance, and stratification between humans and non-humans. All these approaches offer interesting possible trajectories for the application of Marx to understanding human commodification of non-human life and provide potentially useful frameworks for thinking about how to approach pro-animal political change. Extending beyond this, my interest in Marx is quite specific and is focused on developing a, a viable counter-narrative to liberal ethics as a way to respond to structural violence against animals. Arguably, liberal, analytic liberal ethics within animal studies has devoted itself to understanding animal capabilities or ontologies in order to de determine just or ethical treatment. So a classic example of this is Tom Regan's approach in the case of animal rights. A, Regan acknowledges that uh, moral status rests upon awarding recognition based upon capability for agency. And thus Regan develops a concept of, quote, moral patience, so many of you would have read this work, as a means to include human and non-human others who are owed rights but lack the requisite traits to be recognised as agents in themselves. In this view, intrinsic qualities determine moral worth or value. Against these analytic approaches, I'm more interested in the question of how social and political structure determines the political subjectivity of animals and generates their value. As Marx emphasises, and as I shall discuss below, value is always a construction. Animals have value in our social, political and economic systems, a value that is produced by social relations. The violence that animals are subject to in their commodification is a product of these relationships, and in an absolute sense, a mere reflection of the social, political, and economic value that is placed upon animals. In a sense, this is the, world, the animal welfare approach. From my perspective, a highlight, this highlights the importance of focusing not, on the, not only on the ontological or intrinsic meaning or value of animals as, an, as a means for grounding ethics, but also understanding the systems of exchange and production that generate values in animal life and death, and understanding the dynamic of their violence. Part one, animals and capitalism, a logical contradiction. Astute readers of Marx will be aware that contradiction plays an important conceptual role in his thought. On one hand, Marx is always attentive to the apparent divisions that are hidden behind unity. So for example, while ruling elites might depict societies as comprising harmonious, unified, and happy citizens, bound together by a social contract. Marx insists that all societies, societies contain divisions that were structured by the ways in which goods were produced and values were agreed upon. In, this, in the case of capitalism, as we know, Marx points out a tendency towards two fundamental classes who have opposing interests, those who own capital and those who work. This is a relationship of material and logical contradiction something Marx is at pains to describe through much of his writing, and if anyone's had to delve through Marx, you know that contradiction is literally on every single page of Marx. <laughs> For example, Marx would highlight the way in which labour is the most valuable component in the production process. Workers are the only ones that can add value to a product through labour. In this story, it is through labour, the labour of workers, that raw materials are transformed into something of value as a commodity that can be sold for profit. However, the tendency of capitalism is to reduce the cost of labour, preferably to zero in the name of profit. <coughs> Thus we see a contradictory set of processes emerge. A high value circulation of, of products such as smartphones and designer clothing, which generate huge profits for the owners of capital, yet simultaneously, through processes of globalisation, low wage or forced labour used within supply chains become instrumental, an instrumental part of the production, of pro production process for these goods. None of these products can be made without human labour. However, human labour is in many respects the most devalued commodity 
in the process. And your phone is the perfect example of this. And people here will know that um, there's low wage and potentially slave labor in, encased in the phone. This sort of logical contradiction does not in itself pose a problem for the continuation of a production process for Marx. On the contrary, for Marx, our world is full of contradictory processes, which while they pose a logical or philosophical contradiction, nevertheless represent a material, structural reality. In the case of capitalism, its profitability rests upon contradictory processes of extorting as much value for labour as possible in generating a surplus, even if this very labour is the only way for profit to be generated. This contradiction in values um, does not necessarily undermine the structural reality of the world we live in. We live in a world where rich and poor live next to each other, where quite literally the rich feed off the labour of the poor, but this contradiction is not in, in itself enough to undermine the economic system that arbitrarily produces this inequality. Co contradiction, then, is an odd thing for Marx. Indeed, for Marx, contradiction is a process that is both violent and productive. It is violent because of the material damage it imposes on those who bear the force of the contradiction. In the case of workers under capitalism, this means poverty and deprivations, meaningless, drudgerous work and alienation. The flip side of this process, though, <coughs> is that contradiction provides the basis for resistance against power and modes of organisation and collectivity that had not previously been imagined. For example, in the case of workers under capitalism, capitalism creates the means workers to collectively organise and demand better conditions and protection. So Marx is at pains to point out that only capitalism will create the capacity for unions to be formed. At least in Marx's utopian vision, this creates the social forms that would follow after capitalism had fallen. In this sense, contradiction need not be a problematic theme in Marx's model. On the contrary, the process of change which generates contradiction also generates new opportunities for change. Part two, the intrinsic use value of animals. I would argue that there are a number of contradictions that relate to our use of animals under capitalism, perhaps none more pronounced than the contradictions that revolve around the politics of value. In some respects, the classic debates over animal rights, those which have come from the liberal analytic tradition, have been essentially about dealing with contradictions in value. Peter Singer, for example, names these contradictions in how we treat animals versus how we treat humans with the term that we're all familiar with, speciesism. As I stated at the beginning of my talk, the welfarist response, at least John Webster's response, begins with the contradiction in value and the need to find a realist solution to this contradiction. This contradiction being, namely, the growing perception that animals have an intrinsic value in themselves beyond the use value that humans apply to them and simultaneously the reality that in a free market society all values, or at least the values that matter, are determined apparently by the market. I think there's much more to say here about this contradiction in value, and this is where Marx is useful. Firstly, for Marx the idea of intrinsic value is less interesting than the concept of use value. A commodity becomes useful to us because it has utility for us. Food is useful for us, for example, because it nourishes us and allows us to survive. Shelter is useful for us in keeping us secure from the elements. Clothing is useful because it keeps us warm and serves social functions, including maybe preserving modesty, and so the whole range of social functions within our society. We might perhaps suggest that some commodities have a kind of intrinsic use value. That is, that there is something essential in the quantity which makes it, makes it useful to us. Some commodities, such as water, have an obvious intrinsic use value, since they are bare, are bare requirements of survival, indeed a basic requirement for all life. However, many use values are themselves a product of social values and not related to the intrinsic quality of the commodity. In my phone, um, there's this in my pocket there's this phone, uh, which has a use value for me, perhaps even a high use value, as I cannot imagine living my life without this phone. However, I acknowledge that the use value of my phone is not necessarily a product of its intrinsic qualities. A phone only becomes valuable in a social, political and economic context, 
It is only because social relationships mediated by vast technological systems that it is only through these vast technological systems that the, that the device has utility and its value as a commodity is enhanced by social values of inclusion, prestige and mobility. A phone is useless without a telephone network to support it. And it is because of a range of social and economic networks, you need a phone to keep friends, to study, to hold down a job, certainly this is all true today, that a phone is truly indispensable. Simply, you are nobody unless you have a phone in today's contemporary world. For Marx, the process of valorizing a commodity within social relations was described with the phrase commodity fetishism. In this view, the value of a commodity reflects, and I quote, the socio-natural properties of these things, end quote. In other words, our attempts to determine the intrinsic use value of a thing are always muddied by the reality of what any commodity means within any given society and the social relations within that society. There is a long controversy within Marx scholarship on the relationships between intrinsic or the natural use values of commodities and whether these even exist. And it's socio the socio-natural properties would give any commodity value. But the tension in, in, is in a sense illustrative of a tension that circulates most commodities of particularly animals within capitalism. For in the case of animals we have today, I believe, a perverse situation which is suggestive of, of a deep contradiction inherent to capitalism, which relate, relates to the difference between the inherent use value of animals <coughs> and the relative exchange value, that is the value that markets are willing to give them as commodities. A number of processes can be identified to make sense of this contradiction. I would argue that these processes are tied with the emergence of capitalism, industrialization, and recently globalization all of which have fundamentally shifted the intrinsic use value of animals to humans. The first is that some of the historic drivers of animal use have almost completely disappeared today, particularly the view that animals should be a store of wealth, so animals were used as currency in the previous economies, or as a means of insurance, or that draft animals should be part of production processes. Of course, the picture here is not necessarily straightforward, Recently, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization and other international organizations have been singing the praises of, of draft animals. In fact, there's been a resurgence in the use of draft animals in some parts of the world. As, new, as a new environmentally friendly solution to the poverty of small farmers in Asia and sub-Saharan Africa. However, globally, the overall trend seems to be towards reduction. In India, for example, which has traditionally had the highest utilization of draft animals of any country globally, there's been a rapid decline in the use of draft animals, which is then accompanied by growth in mechanization. One claim suggests that during the, the 1970s, some 45% of energy consumed uh, in India related to animal power. Today, 95% of energy consumed in India um, goes towards, like in, in the context of agriculture, goes towards mechanised forms of farming. So there's been this massive shift away from the use of draft animals. The second shift in the intrinsic use value of animals relates to animals for food. The question of whether we need animals for food is of course a contention, contentious one, and in some ways, at least for animal advocates, infuriating. I don't need to tell you this, it's an incredibly <laughs> infuriating question. Those who dare, dare to suggest that there's no intrinsic need to eat animals are barraged with a range of perspectives. Perspectives ranging from views that humans are somewhat naturally, biologically predisposed to eat meat, I'm, I'm going to list all the infuriating meat, <laughs> <laughs> to views that meat eating is a fundamental aspect of cultural and linguistic heritage and therefore represents a cultural right, to views that humans do favours to domestic animals by using them for food since, the, since this is a better life than the life animals would face in the wild, to views that work, the world cannot reasonably sustain vegetarian diets or vegan diets on a large scale, and perhaps more recently, the view that eating a plant-based diet contributes more to large-scale animal death, for example, the extermination of rodents necessary for large-scale plant production <laughs> than a meat-based diet. All these infuriating arguments that you all know. There's a lot to unpack, unpack here, and lots of valuable scholarship happening uh, internationally, which has tried to put some of these views into perspective and challenge them. I would note two things, though. First, that despite a lot of international press, including from organisations such as the UN Food and Agriculture Organisation, animal-based proteins do not 
make up the majority of the world's food intake. This varies, of course, by region, and we, but we know that the, and we know that the per capita intake of animal proteins in developing in developed nations is relatively high, and that consumption in developed countries is low. However, despite stark divisions between different countries and their consumption patterns, and despite growing per capita global consumption of meat, vegetable proteins remain the main way all of the world, particularly less developed countries, get their protein. And this is something I find quite diverse. So if you read, uh, I do some work on fish, if you read UN Food and Agriculture Organisations uh, documentation, you'll say fish protein is vital to the developing world. Yet yeah, fish protein makes up a small proportion of what the world eats. Right? So most, most of what the world eats is vegetable protein and remains so today. A different way to look at that capacity to, sorry, sorry. Second, the same processes of industrialization and intensification that have increased the use of animals have also increased the production of vegetables and grains worldwide. Per capita consumption of vegetable-based proteins have continued to decline. We know that per capita meat consumption has increased. But in a weird way, this only underlines the world's capacity to produce grain, since the global growth of industrialised animal production has also been accompanied by an industry, uh, by an industry of veg vegetable protein production to intensively feed farm, factory farmed animals. I'm not telling anybody here anything new. There is more than enough evidence that the world has a fearsome capacity to produce vegetable protein. A different way to look at our capacity to produce plant-based protein is to examine global food wastage. A UN Food and Agriculture document uh, finds that, quote, roughly one-third of the edible parts of food produced for human consumption get lost or wasted globally, which is about 1.3 billion tonnes of food per year, end quote. It's sobering to realise that the most significant losses occur in the production of fruit and vegetables most often as part of the grading process prior to sale, so the apple's too small, so we chuck it out. Developing and developed nations have vastly different ways that they waste food. In developing nations, this largely occurs at the site of production. In developed countries, as many of you know, this happens at the site of consumption. We put lots of food in the bin of the order of 15 to 30 percent of vegetables that are consumed in developed countries. Whether there's enough vegetable protein available or well, at least enough industrial capacity available to feed the world is a question that is beyond me to answer. I'm not a food scientist. However, any discussion about global food availability must surely be connected to the global geopolitics of food distribution and uh, the economics of inequality. UN, UN figures now indicate that one in nine people globally face undernourishment, that is 795 million people. However, we know that people don't starve to death because there is a lack of food in the world. And certainly the UN and other international agencies have been quite clear about this. So in 2009, the Food and Agriculture State Organization stated in no uncertain terms that, quote, the world produces enough food to feed everyone, and it's enough, food to, enough to provide everyone in the world with at least 2,720 calories per day, end quote. In other words, it seems reasonable to say that there is lots of food to go around. But we face problems in how we distribute available food efficiently. Indeed, we know that globalisation and developments in transportation and refrigeration systems have enabled vast international distribution networks that might effectively respond if there were market incentives to do so. Today, there's a global export market for fruits such as strawberries from California, bananas from Central America, frozen vegetables on the shelves of supermarkets might come from China or Chile or Belgium. Recently, our esteemed Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, proposed contracting out foreign, Australia's foreign aid, aid program to private companies like Coca-Cola. Her argument, this is true, right? her, her argument was that, quote, although remote villages and regions in the Pacific face problems getting access to essential medicines, Coca-Cola is available everywhere throughout the Pacific, end quote. The question, I think, is underlined, so this is not in Julia Bishop's mind. No. <laughs> the question is, how do we create effective mechanisms to distribute resources uh, a global free market proves inefficient, as we know, in responding to hunger and poverty. And as the waste of statistics demonstrates, we face inefficiencies in using food resources effectively. In other words, the capacity to distribute commodities is present. 
We simply lack the value system to affect change. The summary of all of these processes is that when it comes to food, we have a number of contradictions before us, many revolving around the question of value. And there is a particular contradiction that relates to animals and their intrinsic value. The developments I've described that are part and parcel, parcel of capitalism, industrialization, and globalization have reduced the intrinsic use value of animals to humans, at least for food, to an absolute low point. Industrialization has progressively eliminated the, the need to use animals as draft power for industries. Indeed, arguably, it is only preventable poverty, which means that animals remain in use in developing countries for this purpose. We have the capacity through industrial processes to grow plant protein on a massive scale. Despite the acceleration in the use of animals for food globally, plant-based materials remain the main way most of the world's population is fed. It is true that undernourishment faces too many humans on the planet. However, these are problems related to, to global inequality and the inefficient distribution of resources and not the availability of animals for food. Globalisation has given us the distribution networks to make plant-based proteins available to a large number of people. Perhaps, as our esteemed foreign minister has indicated, the distribution networks that make it possible to find Coca-Cola anywhere on the planet simultaneously make it possible to imagine plant-based protein being made available anywhere on the planet. In other words, from a structural perspective, and not just an ethical perspective, and just thinking about food animals, we don't need to use animals. They have little or no intrinsic use value to us. Yet we use animals on a growing scale that has never been before seen. The contradiction here is between intrinsic use value and exchange value, the amount animals are worth as commodities, as bearers of profit. Animals exchange as commodities for reasons other than because we both need them. The value of animals then is purely about their socially realised value, rather than anything to do with their intrinsic qualities. Animals circulate as commodities, they have value because of a combination of both the investment of human pleasures in, the, in this commodity for me to clothing, and simultaneously, a global investment in this quantity, not as an end in itself, but as a means of profit, as a carrier of profit. What is the solution to this contradiction? There seem to be a few voices within animal there seem to be a few voices within animal advocacy and environmental movements arguing that we need to think about moving back to smaller scale communities. The argument here is that if we go back to producing food within local communities and exercising control over production then we might be able to address some of the forms of exploitation inherent to industrialised production, um, reduce the carbon footprint associated with food distribution networks, and apply normative values to some forms of production, including paying more attention to what happens to animals. Usually these go, views go hand in hand with the idea of curbing human population growth. Underpinning these views is a justified disillusionment with capitalism, industrialisation and globalisation. Against these views, I would like to suggest a different perspective. Capitalism, industrialization, and globalization have given us tools for imagining a world where the intrinsic use value of animals, at least for food, is near zero. We can finally imagine a world where most people, if not all, could feasibly survive without animals. Of course, there are huge impediments to realizing such a world. I'm not kidding myself here. But in a sense, it is interesting to note that we have reached this point. This thing is important to recognise, and it's important to recognise the role of capitalism, industrialisation and globalisation in this process. This does not mean that capitalism, industrialisation and globalisation have been good for animals. On the contrary, everyone here knows that these processes have led to the intensification of the exploitation of animals on a massive scale. However, perversely, these processes have overseen a dramatic shift in the value system underpinning the domination of animals, so that perhaps for the first time it's possible to imagine living without animals. Again, contradiction here is both violent, disorienting and alienating, and simultaneously productive. Marx noticed that at a certain point in the development of capitalism, it would become apparent that most, that most of the world were working for poor wages to produce most of the world's wealth, while a small elite took the world's wealth with little evidence of merit for the, for, for the profit that 
of profits that they claim. In Marx's view, this contradiction created the possibility of imagining a world without the capital owning class, since they quite literally contributed nothing to productivity. Indeed, in volume three of Capital, Marx is at pains to point out that capitalism ends up alienating everybody. Capitalism becomes a social power that, quote, no longer stands in any kind of possible kind of relationship to, to what the work of one particular individual can create, end quote. In line with this sort of Marxist conception of contradiction, then, I'm suggesting the story of animals under capitalism is similarly a bittersweet one. Contradiction here produces immense, unnecessary violence against animals that we no longer have in any intrinsic need to expose to violence in the name of our own survival. But simultaneously, it's the processes of capitalism, industrialization, and globalization that have enabled a situation where we might imagine doing without this violence. The relationship of these social processes themselves are in a sense autonomous from the intrinsic use value of animals. And it is this contradiction that creates the possibility of imagining change. How do we move forward? I can't pretend to have all the answers. How I would hazard a guess that the challenge is how to intervene in these processes that relate to animal value. One way to think about this is to think more on labour. According to Marx's theory, the capitalist production process aims to capture value from labour, so-called surplus value, which forms the basis of the productivity of capital, in fact it's its incentive. Typical labour strategies aim to intervene in the extraction of value. This was precisely the response of labour to the arrival of capitalism. Unions fought several successive campaigns internationally in relation to pay and conditions and hours of work. The global campaign, for example, for the eight-hour day during the early part of the 20th century was one of the kind of really successful international movements. In these cases, the terms of resistance were over the politics of value, how much labour was worth, and how and when this value could be extracted. Thinking about animals, one way forward is to think about animals as labourers. Different scholars, such as Jason Hebrell, Bob Torrance, and Donna Haraway, weirdly, have argued that animals may be considered labourers within productive systems. I think there's a lot of benefit in thinking about further about the nature of this labour and how value is extracted, and importantly, how animals may be recom recompensed for the material debts that humans owe them. And tomorrow in the conference, I'm going to talk a little bit about some ideas around this. I'll leave that aside for now, because that's what I'm currently working on. But I think this is an area for much further development. A different way to think about the politics of value is to consider the sort of alliance politics which might enable fundamental change. Contradiction generates, uh, generates shifts in systems of value, and production creates new alliances, as those who were previously alienated find themselves sharing common interests with those that they never imagined they would. I would argue that one area in which this is happening is in the relationship between human labour and meat industries and the animals being slaughtered. Industrialisation of animal production has fundamentally shifted the role of human labour within production systems. Everyone here knows the nature of this labour within slaughterhouses. It is frequently highly skilled, with little training offered and low pay. High production speeds and the nature of work frequently makes it, frankly, dangerous. Um, in Australia, animal agriculture has the second highest number of workplace fatalities, um, and, and there were 53 reported fatalities in 2012. There is a global tendency towards slaughterhouse labour becoming extremely precarious, particularly in relation to the increased use of temporary migrant labour. We also know that, know that forced labour, or slavery, is part and parcel of, of a number of global industries, including meat production. For example, the role of slavery in the global fish industry has been identified by a number of activists and scholars. All this indicates that the processes of globalisation, industrialisation and capitalism are converging today to produce meat industries as a site of hyper-exploitation of both animals and humans. I should be clear here that I'm not saying that humans and animals have the same interests or suffer the same harms in these industries. Human meat workers can go home after their shift. Animals have no such luxury. Humans are forced to endure low, low pay or forced labour, um, but animals lose their life as part of animal production for meat. However, I believe that there's a convergence of interests here. 
including the shared interests of both human workers and animals, potentially in ending factory farming. Lots of animal welfare and animal rights work focuses on consumption as a site for change. For example, encouraging people to adopt a plant-based diet. However, some of these shifts in the nature of industrialised food, industrialized food system, production suggests that the site of production, that is the place where animals can find and cook for food, but also where labour is hyper-exploited, potentially offered, offered opportunities for shared campaigning. To conclude, I'd like to briefly focus on two ways to think about how to use an alliance of politics to intervene in the politics of value with a specific interest in the site of the production of animal death by the slaughterhouse. One area, and one which is close to home, is the campaign around live exports. The vectors of the campaign should be familiar to everybody here. Australian meat exporters remain committed to the profitability of a live animal export trade. Australia is the world's largest supplier of live animal exports internationally. And this produces perverse conditions for animals, including high rates of death, injury and suffering for animals associated with the transportation process, and potential conditions faced by animals when they disembark and are slaughtered overseas. The focus of Australian campaigning has largely been on the conditions of slaughter at destination <coughs> slaughterhouses. This has produced a perverse effect where there's been a lot of public concern generated in relation to, a des to destination country slaughter practices, some of which has been overtly xenophobic, which has in turn created the misperception that slaughter practices in Australia are better, better than elsewhere. In line with this, the Australian government's response has been to put forward the view that Australia has the best animal welfare protection in the world, end quote, and uh, as far as I can see, this is a completely untested assumption. <laughs> um, and to now argue that the ideal response is to use its resources to improve welfare standards in destination countries and thus cement the live export trade as a geopolitical reality. The Australian government response is suggestive of a broader picture here. Live export represents the globalisation of animal production, and Australia is working to be a key player in this globalised industry. Thus, it is no surprise that the recent free trade agreement with China featured live export as a centrepiece of the agreement. Here, the active factor isn't whether destination countries prefer to slaughter animals in their own way, but rather what the price of labour is. Like other globalising industries, production is located where labour is cheapest. In this sense, one view of the live export situation we find ourselves in today is that Australia is positioning itself in a new geopolitical reality where we have the capacity to export animals live to destinations which have the labour efficiencies to slaughter animals in a more cost-effective way. If this analysis, in other words, they screw the workers on the other side of the, of the ocean. If this analysis is reasonable, then we face we have a few strategic responses. One is the nationalistic response. Uh, similar to the response that has accompanied uh, other campaigns against globalisation, and a response that I think um, has largely been seen from pro-animal advocates and unions today, and that is to argue for local labour to continue killing animals in preference to labour overseas. A different response, and one I think we should think about, is using international solidarity networks to support labour rights for workers everywhere. Since live export would not make financial sense were it not for low wage labour available across borders, this does not mean supporting live export. We need to highlight the fact that sending animals across seas is just cruel, transporting animals is cruel. Um, nor does this mean supporting the killing of animals. But it does mean refusing to play the game, pretending that Australia kills its animals in a more civilised way than elsewhere and so refusing to support the international game of reducing the price of labour elsewhere. I mean, labour is labour, it should be the same price. But everyone here is interested in how we stop killing animals and not how we protect workers who end up taking on the job of killing animals. Are there ways to imagine ending animal killing that can rely on an, animal, an alliance politics between workers in slaughterhouses and those who are sent to die there? What are the politics of value here? I haven't spoken much about my new book, The War Against Animals, but I'd like to to draw here on a thought experiment that I propose in the conclusion of the book, a thought experiment on how we might imagine truce in the war against animals. In this thought experiment, I found myself really fascinated by um, some of the history of radical feminist history, 
um, and particularly um, a fragment uh, from a theorist called Andrea Dawkin. So in 1983, Dawkin provided an address to the Midwest Regional Conference of the National Organization for Changing Men in Minnesota, a men's rights group, uh, uh, an audience of 500 men and very few women. Uh, in Andrea Dawkin's note, she observes that she was presented with the opportunity to speak to her audience and she says, quote, this was a feminist dream come true. What would you say to 500 men if you could? It's a really kind of fascinating moment. <laughs> and literally Dawkins talks about the fact that she flew in, gave the speech, and then had to fly out. So she didn't actually have, have question time so she could say exactly what she felt <laughs> to 500 men. She says lots of predictable things, and the, the, the speech is available online. Um, but Dawkins, in this context, makes a remarkable plea to her audience. And I quote, I want one day off, one day of respite, one day in which no new bodies are piled up, one day in which no new agony is added to the old. I'm asking you to give it to me, and how could I ask for less, so little? How could you offer me less? It is so little. Even in wars, there are days of truce. Go and organise a truce. Stop your side for one day, she's talking to the men. I want a 24-hour truce during which there is no rape. Dawkin goes on. And on that day of truce, that day when not one woman is raped, we will begin the real practice of equality, because we can't begin it before that day. Before that day, it means nothing, because it is nothing. It is not real. It is not true. But on that day, it becomes real. And then instead of rape, we will, for the first time in our lives, both men and women, begin to experience freedom." End quote. It is important to note the care by which Dawkins constructs the promise of truce in the war against women, and that's what she's referring to. Truce is not, in her vision here, an equality in power, nor the equitable distribution of the means of violence. Truce is not the final answer. It is only one way to consider a new allegiance, one which operates within the reality of, of a historical and potentially continuing war, and provides the foundation for a different sort of friendship, a different sort of politics. This is the beginning for, as Dworkin phrases it, the real practice of equality, a practice not a settled state, but a necessary, messy, and difficult process of negotiation and renegotiation. And by the way, the why, reason why I find this really fascinating is I can't imagine what our world would look like if we didn't exploit animals. And in a way, she's, she's asking this question, well, what would it look like? How would we start? We can't actually imagine this world. Playing with Dworkin's concept of temporary truce, I found myself wondering if there might be tactical benefit in calling for one day, just one day, where violence against animals stops. It's with this imagining I'd like to end with this practical speculation. If we were to campaign for a one day end to the war against animals, what would this look like? What appeals to me about campaigning for one day without killing is that it would substanti substantially differ from other sorts of action, such as a campaign to, for example, go vegan for one day. The difference is that the action aims at the site of production and not the site of consumption. As such, it seems to intervene in the economies of values during the production of value of, of animals into meat, rather than an action that simply asks those who consume animal products to become ethical consumers. A one-day truce could thus disrupt the process which allows the death to be the moment at which value is extracted from the animal, because let's be honest, under capitalism, animals are only valuable because they can be made dead. And against this commodification, the truce would underline that, that animals have an interest in the value of their own lives as lived, and thus intervene in a process which imposes value on the death, deaths of animals for profit. What strategies would be required? One strategy must surely be to focus on workers who are directly involved in the process of killing and form alliances with organisations representing human labour. Temporary alliances between animal advocates and slaughterhouse workers have occurred, for example, that occurred in Australia around live exports. And of course, much information about blatant cruelty and breach of welfare standards within slaughterhouses have originated from alarmed workers themselves. I mean, in a way, some of these alliances are real. In order to achieve truce, one day without killing, might we have to explicitly organise the slaughterhouse staff, including migrant and precarious workers and their communities who are employed within the heart of the animal industrial complex? Might this campaign need to focus both on the violence of killing and the violence experienced by workers themselves in this process? 
how might we structure the messaging of this campaign, knowing that the human workers will go back to killing after the truth, as there's no other work we can reasonably offer them? What alternative type of political engagement might be needed to sustain this allegiance? In the early 20th century, many leftists and trade unionists, unionists called for all labour to unite, unite together and strike together, withdraw from production. And this is what has been called the general strike. This is one of the kind of tactical goals of many of the left unions in, in the left movement. Though utopian to imagine that all workers could find agreement in this way for a whole range of industries to go on strike and drop, tool, drop tools for one day. Um, there are a number of successful general strikes that have been recorded over the last 150 years, including very recently in Spain and Slovenia. Perhaps the most dramatic, successful, dramatic international example of a global strike was May Day, the annual public holiday for workers established after 1886, founded on the campaign for the eight-hour day, which at least for much of the 20th century represented by an intervention by workers themselves in the politics of value. In some ways, the truce I'm calling for mirrors the May Day campaign. It also seeks to intervene in systems of production and engage with the material politics of value. No doubt achieving truce would require, require us to abandon particular modes of engagement and call on us to invent new ones. Most likely we will need to suspend individual forms of consumption ethics in favour of looking toward the longer term strategic problem of how we can realistically intervene in the production process of killing animals and reduce animal death. I certainly do not claim to have an easy set of answers on how we move forward. However, I believe we can attend to the material effects of the contradictions in value that con confront us, then perhaps a different sort of political strategy is required from the prominent modes of engagement that confront us today. If we are to form new alliances, to reimagine how we engage in social movements and intervene in value production, might we be able to imagine a world where the intrinsic value of animals and the intrinsic value that nobody, can re nobody here can realistically deny is actually recognised by the material systems of production that confront us. Can we use structural change to affect this alignment? Thank you so much. <laughs> Just as losing a voice, so I, I offered to, to I, I love questions or thoughts. Um, as I said, it's experiments. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on your thoughts, and um, I've heard if you can communicate that. Thank you. This should indicate that per capita meat consumption should go down. 
but this, the, we all know that it's actually gone the other way. So, from my perspective, this, if this was the tactic, then the tactic doesn't work. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't become vegan. There are good reasons to become vegan. And I think there are good conversations about the politics of well, well, why is it important for us all to kind of think about this sort of how do we remove ourselves. Um, the other thing to think about, uh, just in terms of desertion, is that just on that front, um, in the book I talk a bit about um, Foucault has these, sorry, this is a nerdy Foucault moment. So in, in, the, in the kind of late 70s, he, he looks at what he calls counterconduct movements. And what he's interested in is not only where people resist, but people uh, literally live their lives through a different sort of truth. And so they, they, there's this prevailing barrage of truths around them, and they literally construct their lives in this completely different way. Um, one of the examples he gives is the flagellants. And he says, well, um, the church said one thing, and the flagellants say, actually, we've got better, we've got a closer access to God. We, our truth is more, if better than the, the truth of the church. This might sound weird, but I think the flagellants remind me of their things. Good and bad. But the reason I think there's something interesting about the story is that um, many of the, if, if, of the people here who take on a kind of, who practice veganism, you will have had the experience where friends, well-meaning relatives, and parents <laughs> say, you are killing yourself. Why are you doing this? Your doctor will literally barrage you with stuff saying, why are you doing this? You've got to be careful, right? And often the practice of veganism is literally about, I'm going to, I, I know your truth, I'm going to live my life in this way. So it's one thing, I, so I think there's something really interesting about the politics of desertion in a way that potentially this is about inventing a new truth. In, 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 so that it does productive work. But it's all separate from the question of, that is, it, is it a tactical response to the animal industrial complex? From my view, I just don't see that it's a tactical I think there are important things that it does, but it doesn't doesn't necessarily. From my looking at the evidence, I don't see how it can shift. Um, and this is because, of course, capital is invested in its own production process. So this is kind of, kind of reality that consumption is here, but it's, consumption doesn't drive production. Well, this is kind of in my mind. So it's kind of the other the other question that you asked though was. Um, the, the contradiction between workers and pro-animal advocates working together. Um, of course, there's, there's contradiction. Okay, of course, but so it's about how do we form temporary alliances? Just knowing that, of course, we have differences. Of, I mean, all alliances are about people with fundamentally different interests you know, finding the common ground. I'm curious whether what is happening globally in terms of the intensification and centralisation of animal production, of, of food production, what is happening for labour, particularly the use of precarious, um, very low paid, in some cases slave labour, gives us a situation where the timeline, and remember, like if you look at Australia, this has been one of the big shifts. So Australia meat production was largely carried out by highly, highly unionised workforce, it still is, right? but we all know this is shifting. And internationally, we know that what the labour force that is going to produce animals in the future, in 20 years, is going to look completely different from today. Does this create opportunities for us to be working with labour? That doesn't mean that we can offer them jobs. It doesn't mean that the contradictions don't disappear. But do, does it create alliances where um, we can affect change? But the final, the final thing on that, all of that, is consumption, the politics of veganism, and this is, this is just a, a question I ask, the politics of veganism to me creates a situation where we all try to become kind of cruelty-free, perfect selves or something and this becomes the object of, of the, the practice. In some ways, I think, this distracts from the, the, the main task, which is to stop animals being killed. And that's, that's, that's what I'm kind of interested in, is can we stop animals being killed? Is that, is that different? And that's why the, the side production seems more interesting to me. Than the side of um, okay, first of all, thank you for the interesting. Interesting, it kind of resonates a lot with Debate at the moment in Germany, 
both in getting rights movement and in small parts of the environmental studies community. And within the animal rights movement, there's um, most people that highlight, you know, this kind of strain of arguments that you were, you were giving are uh, coming from a communist background. And there's one particular part in Mark's work that uh, you haven't really, you know, worked with in your speech, and I would be interested in what your thoughts are about that class work. That's basically the idea um, that all of these, you know, these activists in Germany, they would work for example, argue that the only way that we can, you know, close down slaughterhouses, for example, is that if, like, if we own them. So we first have to own them, that doesn't mean obviously that as part of private property, but rather in a social way of you know, the community owns that like we all uh, you know we all agree on how we want to produce and then we can also agree on what's doing of this kind of stuff. So I would like to know what your thoughts are about um, this particular Marxist idea of social change because this is a big part of what you talked about. Yeah. I mean so the kind of thing the big I think I've got about so part of the tendency Marx talks about is capitalism produces forms of social production. So that it, it puts people together producing in ways that they can, and that's the point that you can't, no one individual can produce stuff. To me, there's, there's two sides of this, and one is that the kind of capacity we have internationally to produce vegetable protein is precisely a product of this social productive process. And Probably like uh, much of the labor movement um, and the, the left, my, my view is the democratic question is who controls this? The, the reality for us under capitalism is that this is controlled by you know, the capital and the class, it's not, it's, you know. And the impact of that unequal ownership, poverty, environmental devastation, climate change, we all know. And so there's a kind of vested interest in that. Um, the question of well, what do animals want? And in a way, animals are part of this social production process. Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess that's that's why I think the question that do animals labour is actually a really important question. Of this. Um, I'm interested in resistance, <coughs> and particularly so I, did, I, I gave a talk last year about fish resistance. I'm particularly interested in uh, autonomous Marxist perception. Perspectives on resistance, and that to me is one way to look at the problem. And so, sorry, that's a really technical kind of response. Um, but I'm still kind of working through it for how we think about that later. So, sorry, it's not a complete answer. Sylvia Federici at the Caliban Bridge describes how capitalism is basically made possible or triggered by the enclosure of land and the enclosure of simultaneous you know, women's bodies. Yeah. So the oppression of women is one of the precursors to capitalism. Yeah. Um, could you extend your like sort of first ideas of the idea of the sort of same sort of thing about the oppression of animals? Right. So that, that's that's a really great question. Um, so Federici and Marxist feminists will point out that um, capitalism subsumes all sorts of life. And it subsumes it in different kinds of ways. On one hand, the labour of women is subsumed as what's called unproductive labour. And it's unproductive not because it isn't productive, it's because it's not paid. And so much of the kind of Marxist feminist tradition has pointed out that um, women, one of the contradictions, if you like, of capitalism is that some of the most important labour that props up the survival of capitalism is this unpaid labour that women do. If, um, if women were able to withdraw this labour, then capitalism falls down. And actually, you know, there's a lot of more recent analysis which demonstrates this. Um, I think there's a similar story going on with, with animals, of course. And I think that's some of the more re there's some really recent work. Uh, my, my colleague at the University of Sydney, Melinda Cooper, doing really interesting work about how do we understand labour and particularly non-productive labour. And so I'm kind of really interested in what is this, are these some ways to think about labour? The flip side of that is that Marx um, treats labour as non-productive where it cannot be remunerated with money. Um, but I think there's a really interesting <coughs> question about is that, all the, is that all there is about how we remunerate labour? As I mentioned, one of the most kind of uh, 
successful, if you like, global labour campaigns of the 20th century was the campaign for the eight-hour day. And this was a campaign not for money, but for time. Um, and I think, it, it, for example, the question of do we pay wages to animals? Maybe there's an argument to say we, um, we don't owe animals money, but there's lots of argument to say, and I'll talk a bit about this tomorrow, to say there's lots of things we can actually provide animals. And that they go beyond welfare. So maybe there's some different ways to, you know, these are, none of these are perfect tools, but I think there's some really interesting questions about labour, value, what is class of productive and productive labour, how value, how labour is paid for, and some of the feminist, uh, Marxist feminist tradition I think is actually really important to understand here. Hi, thank you so much for your talk, it's really interesting. Um, so, I have two questions for you. The first one is something you mentioned the literature, like there's not very much at all, but you know, Benton and Nibbert. There's, how do you, because I think it's quite unclear in that literature, how do we differentiate between, you mentioned that it's capitalism and industrialism and globalization that causes these contradictions. But in, in that literature, I think there's like, it's not very clear whether it's capitalism or industrialization. And how do we make that distinction? I wonder personally. Yeah, I, I'm the second. Yeah, maybe you could help me with that. Yeah. <laughs> and the second question, so I'm, I'm going to say, like, you mentioned the really annoying things that we get asked as vegans. So That's a really annoying thing that I get asked. Is that, um, so factory farming was created you know, like after the war to feed the working class, and therefore is it not in their interest? No. Which is just a really annoying no. question that I get asked, and I'm not entirely sure how to answer it. Yeah. So. I, I, I don't, I, in terms of how we, how we unpick the differences, or the, I'm, I'm not sure that I have a rock solid answer, and I'm not sure even that we need to. Um, but certainly where I differ from, say, people like Nyberg, is that where some of those analyses treat capitalism as the kind of the final nail in the coffin, or it's a, sort of the most extreme, uh, if we think about species, the most extremely intensification of species. And I'm interested, as I talked about, in the fact that actually maybe in a perverse way, capitalism, industrialization, and globalization have shifted values quite fundamentally in how we, you know, it's made, it, in some ways, I think it has made it possible to imagine feeding the world without them. So I think that's, that's where I differ from them. Although I'd still recognize that, of course, capitalism has intensified the exploitation and suffering the animals. Of course. But I'm not, I'm not sure about how that I'm Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, just, yeah, just all the research, especially uh, the, 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 the ideas towards it at the end. But I wanted to ask something first, just to flesh out a little bit more about um, your uh, analysis of the value of the animals. Uh, and you made this distinction that I'm sort of just kind of trying to kind of clarify a little bit myself between the, um, in, in kind of the intrinsic value of animals, which is hard to reserve, um, and the kind of the market value of the animals and the exchange value of animals. And, and, and so I've looked at the system to create that exchange value as a way to understand what that animal's value is. But then you also mentioned that, that um, you know, unlike water, which does have intrinsic value, But then, I, 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 and I guess I wonder if that's what you really think if you really think that animals don't have any intrinsic use for humans. And you, you mentioned Haraway briefly and with some distancing. I think that's probably just by looking at her as a position. But um, she does kind of draw attention to all of these ways that humans get caught up in kind of these dependent relationships with other species and invertebrates and then the Try and do justice to your great question. 
that was really great. Um, I personally, of course, believe that animals have an intrinsic value. But I, I guess part of what I was saying was that as we're all confronted with, I would say that most of the people here believe that animals have an intrinsic value. But we're confronted with a world where this intrinsic value is violated by a use value incessantly. Um, so that, in a way, like, a, a, so I just made that clear that I personally believe that animals have an intrinsic value. I made the point that animals might, that there's a kind of contention in the Marxist literature around is there such a thing as something having an intrinsic use value? Um, something like water, maybe we could argue if we can't survive without water, maybe it actually has this sort of intrinsic use value. But lots of Marxist scholarship, in fact Marx himself, makes the point that lots of the quantities we surround ourselves with are have socially produced value that only makes sense within the context of society. Um, and that's why I just, it was more of a footnote to say that when I say that animals have, I, I perceive almost zero intrinsic use value today. Um, I, it's, a, it's a contentious thing to say, in a sense, because it actually goes against what lots of Marxist scholarship says, which is, well, the socially realised value of animals as commodities reflects their place in society. I mean, I'm against that, I'd say that maybe there's value in thinking about the intrinsic use value itself. Your final comment, uh, just the final thing on Haraway, um, I think that's what, like in a sense, the, the reality of capitalism is a, as a process, and lots of different scholars in different parts of, you know, of academic endeavour exploring these questions, is that and we all know about this, is that all values end up becoming market values under capitalism. And so one, one of the kind of sad stories about capitalism is that it's almost like it replaces every single value system. And every part of social life gets sucked into capitalism as the main game for how things are valued. The kinds of relationships that humans have with the animals that they love and love, I, I think actively undermine this value system and point to different ways we can imagine them. So, while I disagree with lots of her, I think some of that literature around relational autonomy, let's say, or, or, and sort of relational ontologies, um, is really interesting in trying to map the way that actually, for lots of us, our fundamental connections with animals, if you're an animal person, I'm not necessarily that much of an animal. <laughs> You know, animal person, that sorts of those kind of close connections of love and friendship often contradict the use value that markets place on animals. And that this, like, this is a kind of life tension. In fact, this is often why people convert to looking at the world in quite a different way. Um, lots of people, their, their vegan story is often tied to their companion animal, right? Um, and it's often about that contradiction between the use value that's applied to animal and, I mean, another way to look at this is the debate on how much should you spend at the vet on your dog. You know, this constant question. Yeah, but that's crazy, how could you spend thousands of dollars fixing up your dog, right? It's actually, by the way, it's a, I think a really good example of the way that um, the market determines one value, but the kinds of social connections, the forms of exchange that happen between people beyond money, uh, actively resist and contest the market values that capitalism imposes. I think that's, I think that's really Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. I, I like the way you focus on the production side of things like, rather than the consumption. But I just had a question about the consumption because you kind of pointed to the fact that you know, we've had vegan outreach for decades and yeah, animals have gone up. But I also think, like, from a kind of scientific point of view, like, it's not really a controlled variable, and then maybe it would have gone up even more if it wasn't for vegan outreach, only a small portion of vegan. So I wonder if that yeah, in itself is kind of which purely focus on the consumption of like, focus on the production side. I'm thinking that doesn't necessarily I think we should actually be looking and talking about other strategies. 
so that's part of the work here for me. In fact, lots of the book to me was about how do we reimagine the problem and how does this give us different ways to look and respond to the problem. And so even if we all are committed to um, spreading the word about things and committed to this as a strategy, that doesn't preclude other strategies. In fact, part of the challenge then is how do we rethink that strategy within the context of the others. Um, but just to give you one example of why we need to rethink it. If, that, if, if, if one strategy, if you all say, okay, Dinesh has got a great idea, we should work with slaughterhouse workers, right? We can't go down there and tell slaughterhouse workers, become a vegan, otherwise they're not going to work with you. We're going to have to kind of change some of the politics about how we think about that. So that's the kind of challenge I think we just actually have to grapple with. Kind of what other strategies for you? Um, how they potentially contradictory? Um, and how do we keep the focus on the main game, um, which is stopping animals being killed? How, how, we, how we keep our eyes on that one? Well, sort of, sort of related to that, um, I liked how you were saying you know, how our abuse of animals has given us uh, a way to start imagining how to not use them. I think veganism is sort of that we're putting into action a, an idea towards not using them so that everyone else can see that. Like we're not just, it's not just about you know, making a small change or whatever, it's about giving, giving society the idea that they don't actually have to use animals because it's so ingrained in, in the way we do everything. You know? I was raised by me and family and we, I was told, you know, you can't survive without me. And then I, then I sort of started, you know, exploring the world a bit, and I'm like, hang on, wait a minute, you can. <laughs> so I think that bringing it out there, it is increasing slowly, um, and it is sort of having people that are vegan is helping with the idea that they can don't use communities and therefore their value is changing. Right. Yeah. And so in a way, like. So the, the, the production and the thing that I think is really fascinating and what I find really fascinating, beautiful and exciting about things is that we are part of inventing new practices. Do you like new practices? And that's against the view that veganism is about denying it, which I was talking to with Siobhan about this a couple of nights ago. Against the view that veganism should be about I'm going to deny myself, I'm going to sacrifice myself. Actually, I think what's wonderful about veganism is the community the opportunity to invent completely new ways of living and why imagine living without the violence against animals. Right? That doesn't mean it's possible. We all know it's not possible. Like, it's hard to actually separate ourselves. Right? But there's something really wonderful in that idea we're exploring and that, that is actually productive. I mean, that, is, that is productive and it's productive in a way that standing on a picket line with slaughterhouse workers isn't. Right? So it's, it's a different strategy. Um, I actually have two questions um, if you're indulging. Um, my first question is um, on your thoughts on ideology, uh, Marxist ideology, but also other forms of Marxian ideology, Althusserian, Eugenian, whatever, um, and, and how you think they can uh, provide an understanding of the, uh, the, the analyzing animals in capitalism. Um, and my second question is on the uh, issue of, of emancipatory politics within Marxist uh, thought <coughs> and uh, whether you need to, whether we need to be anti-capitalist to be emancipatory or to have emancipatory politics and I suppose my, my thoughts on that are haven't identity politics and new social movements demonstrated that you can be kind of emancipatory without being anti Maybe a bit of a devil to that. So great big questions, if I don't have any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> one ideology. Um, the, what I think one of the tendencies, so, so we've had a, lots of the animal rights frameworks that we have have come from a liberal analytic approach. And I'm going to do a massive injustice to these approach and try and quickly describe them, but um, there's perhaps behind this the idea that people 
there's a belief in rationality and reason that's important in a mass and country, and that people have the capacity to absorb information and change their behaviour based upon um, truths that seem more feasible. So, and with this, a commitment to societies based upon just democratic institutions that we all participate in. And with this, and these are not, not terrible things, right? with this the idea that we have forms of democratic deliberation within those institutions that will allow us to make change. So lots of, I would say lots of the kind of um, tendency of our rights discourse in that frame has been, let's convince people. And when they're convinced through, through democratic means, through consent, then they can make change. And if we convince enough people, we can make change. My problem with this view is around, one of the, my problems is around ideology. Because the old kind of Marxist view of ideology was something like this. I could be standing in a factory floor and the same processes could be happening around me, but I could see two different realities based upon my ideology. One reality is that I'm being paid a fair wage for my labour and if this is a fair exchange and the market is determined my wage and this is all fair and I'm just going to go to work and do this. The other view is I'm in a situation where I have nothing else to give based on my lack of means of subsistence and I have to surrender to this alienating process of drudgery in order to survive. And you can look at exactly the same world around you and see this world in a completely different way. So in a kind of Marxist tradition of ideology, ideology is really important in that it gives you the ideas that allows you to see the world in a particular way. Um, I'm pretty sure that all of us here have an idea of what this feels like because if you care anything about animals, you can't walk around in this world and not be affronted by what happens to animals. Uh, in a way, like I think that lots of people who have fundamental pro animal discourse or animal rights actually have an ideology about the world and actually frame the world in this kind of way. What I find really interesting is that we don't talk about ideology in in conventional animal rights discourse. So I think it's actually a really powerful way to describe why it is that it's not enough to just simply, say, show somebody a video of cruelty to animals or explain to them rationality. It's actually about a home kind of whole world view. And that's actually what, again, that's why I'm interested in labor, labor, labor movement history. Lots of labor movements were interested in how do we cultivate a world view through our movements? And it's a quite different kind of approach. I'm not 100% I'm not in class Albert's and uh, some of the others, but um, I think this is one area I think is really interesting. Um, the second question, I wrote it, that was such a long reverse answer to that. It was on anti-capitalism and mass yeah. well, but we, we can imagine a world where, I could imagine a world where capitalism gives us veganism. So you go to McDonald's and there's vegan happy meals. And, you know, um, I, this is actually where ideology is important because some of us um, might be happy with that, but some of us might be interested in what are going to be the conditions of production of this world. Are, are there going to be forms of low-wage labour or forced labour that produce this world where we could live where, you know, plant-based diets provide? So, I'm not, I'm not going to say we need, we need to end capitalism to end the exploitation of animals. Actually, I can imagine a world where this happens. But my preference, my politics, my, the preference of my politics is that we work towards a world that ends other forms of violence simultaneously. I mean, that's, so I think that would, that's an ideological question, actually. That's all about which, how do you view the world and what are the most important things? Outside this one here. Oh, mine was pretty much the second question. Okay. <laughs> this was somewhat related to the question you just answered. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about the, uh, sort of the role that veganism has played as both a strategic uh, 
attack and attack it so they can come in and work for rotation, whether that's an effective tactic or not. And also there are vegans to play in creating an ideological shift, both personally and hopefully. And also looking at that in light of capitalism and how capitalism has recuperated or absorbed a lot of that attempt, that revolutionary potential by commodifying veganism and how that also interacts with the fact that through capitalism and industrialization you can get, for example, a vegetarian or a vegan meal in the goblets. But whether in a way, in a perverse way that negates some of the power of veganism to create a broader ideological shift. Yes. I, I think about Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean I think so I genuinely believe that the, the useful thought experiment is the vegan having meal is introduced in a is, it, is this a victory for vegans in the white and white? I mean, I can imagine a world, like, it might be it's 10 years away, in fact, we have the vegan option at McDonald's alongside the vegan option. Is this a victory? Um, in my opinion, maybe this is, actually is an ideological question, by the way, in the sense that one worldview is we, it is a victory because we've managed to, you know, we've managed to penetrate capital itself and we've shifted diets and shifted perceptions so that even capitalism wants to market to consumers. The flip side, and this would certainly be my view, is that this is, I don't think this is a victory. And so the, the victory comes from how do we reduce the number of animals that we kill and how do we potentially reduce that to zero? And how, what, what are the, the stages along that path? Um, I think there's lots to explore with veganism that goes beyond what we, the, the confines of what, how we understand veganism, including veganism as a form of resistance and as a way to create new truths about how we can make veganism. So I think there's a lot to explore. I don't, I don't have the answers on it. But I think there's lots of ways, and this is going beyond the idea that veganism, so I've heard different people say that veganism is the only ethical and political response. I, I would like us to move beyond that to say, how can we imagine veganism in all sorts of different ways to do productive things along that part of ending violence towards animals? How, how, how can we use it in that way? And can we be, be creative, be open about how we do that? So thank you, Dinesh, and can you um, join me in thanking Dinesh for us tonight? which we'll be continuing over the weekend. So please come along if you can only come for one day. Um, out the front we have the time table, you can have a look and buy a t-shirt and give us some money. <laughs> See you all tomorrow.